I did forget that. Okay, great. Yeah, and all of this is already recorded from my first workshop. Sorry, thank you, Margo. Okay, uh, so the contract requirements. Um, we'll be signing a two year contract. And again, I, I made reference to that in the previous slide that you do have two years in which to research, develop, and present your work. Um, you do need to come prepared for the contract you know, meeting, whether it's via phone or uh, virtual meeting with uh, a definitive idea of what the project is going to be or the work, um, kind of a timeline for that, uh, you know, for that work and um, even potentially uh, where you might present this work and um, and who who might be a new and different audience that you are going to try to reach to that is part of the racial equity um, initiative that our office holds very in one of the priorities in our office is the racial and social justice initiative and where we encourage artists, especially the selected artists who are uh, awarded, is to to consider and to think about a new and different audience for your work, uh, who is perhaps an audience that is not um, someone who either is very familiar with Capitol Hill and all the art venues, who is not familiar with the stranger. Um, someone new and different who does not have any kind of exposure to the arts and that could be uh, an age group it could be a uh, racial ethnic group it could be a particular age population it could be uh, another sector so that if your work focuses on uh, i'm just going to throw out an idea um, let's say it focuses on mental health that's what inspired you and your work then perhaps um, reaching out to the mental health community, uh, social workers or therapists, um, just as one example. Uh, but you can do that with any topic, any theme, any issue, uh, what entity is out there, a nonprofit organization, a business who focuses in on this topic or this theme and how might you reach out to that entity. So that's just uh, another, another idea. Um, if the, if the, I, the idea that you're thinking of is taking a work that you have already presented and you're remounting it or refreshing it in some way, that work you do have to demonstrate that it is significantly different from the first time that you presented it. It is acceptable to submit a refreshed or remounted work, but you do have to, uh, during the contract meeting, uh, explain and describe how significantly different it's going to be from the last time that it was presented. Um, so any major changes that you are making to the, uh, to the work. Um, and I think I talked about the uh, the fourth bullet in terms of new and different audience theme issue. Just consider who you might, who that entity, who that community might be that you are going to try to reach out to for your event. Um, the events, the presentations uh, must take place in, within the city of Seattle, the city limits of Seattle. Um, and so uh, you can most certainly invite a broader audience, but it has to take place in the city of Seattle. Um, it does not have to be per se an arts venue. It can be a non-traditional venue and that in and of itself, whether it's perhaps not on Capitol Hill or not downtown, but it might be maybe in Ballard or it might be in West Seattle, um, then how, you know, how do you then uh, invite 
for uh, engage new and different audiences, especially if you're going to be in a non-traditional venue or location where that's primarily an art, let's say an art desert, very few art organizations or activities going on in that neighborhood. Um, again, the, uh, the funding that you receive is also funding that you uh, are able to compensate yourself as well as any of your collaborating artists or uh, could be an editor, it could be a publicist, uh, a technician. Um, uh, so you can consider all of those uh, costs for and supplies and materials. You also want to consider documentation. Uh, we do ask uh, at the end of your project, we do ask um, and invite you to send us images of the work in progress or the finished work. We use those images in our PowerPoints, much like the images that you are seeing uh, in this PowerPoint tonight. Um, but we also use them uh, across the office for all of our PR. So, um, so it gives you greater exposure and we do give credit to the photographer and, the, uh, and or the videographer, depending on what the image is or what the uh, work sample is. Um, you do get up to three installment payments and those and when they come in is entirely up to you. Uh, you do want to consider when you're going to be needing funds, either to make a purchase of um, some supplies and materials, or when you're hoping to, to compensate your collaborators, uh, or you need uh, funds to, um, to put a, um, a deposit for your venue, any or all of the above. Um, but it's the installments are submitted on an invoice that we actually provide. You do not have to create an invoice. We have an invoice form and it's really a, a fill in the blank. Uh, we do ask that in the invoice you do, it's more about the work that has been completed on your, on your idea or your project so that you know, I'm asking for the first installment I got from this point to this point in the project. And so I'm submitting funds because I've completed X, Y, Z for the project. Not, uh, I'm submitting an invoice because I rented a camera and I need money to pay for the camera, the rental of the camera. It's more about the work, the scope of work that you have completed um, between this date and that, and the time of the submittal of the invoice. Next um, slide, please. Okay, so these are items that the City Artists Program uh, funds will not cover. Um, again, if you're uh, the head of an organization and their work, this these funds will not cover uh, that particular idea or venture. Um, purchase of equipment, software, or food are not covered by these funds. Uh, you can, however, rent equipment. And um, as far as rental of uh, anything, you can also include the rental of any workspace that you, during the development uh, of this idea or project. Again, fundraising benefits, religious activities or services are not covered by these funds. So um, it's not unusual to, to have at least uh, one or two um, finished uh, products and the event where the artist will say, I'm actually having this closing event and I'm actually doing this as a benefit for ABC organization that is a very worthy cause. Um, that is not, you cannot use the event 
for this contract as a benefit. So nobody can benefit from these tax base dollars. So what you want to do, if you still want to have a benefit, which is a great idea, is you want to have your opening of your event and then maybe the second night or another night you have a benefit and then because you you have fulfilled your contract expectations of the event for the office of arts and culture thereafter whatever you want to do with your uh with your either exhibit or screening uh or reading then you can do whatever you want after you've done that event for our purposes for the for the office of arts and culture um Again, uh, if you are an artist or curator who has a current active contract for another award in our office, then you are ineligible to apply at this time. You do have to um, make sure that whatever contract is active and open right now, that you pay, that you finish whatever commitments you have under that contract fulfill all the commitments, get paid, and the, and the contract is closed. And if that happens before April 21st, then, then you can apply to City Artists. And I'm happy to uh, talk to anybody if, you, if you're not sure if you fall into that category or not. Um, mostly it's um, individuals who might have applied through Smart Ventures and, um, and that account that or excuse me that contract is still open you have not completed that you want to make sure you get you complete that event get paid close out the contract and then as long as it's before april 21st you can apply to city artists okay next slide oh i guess that's uh, that's the end. And this is an example of, um, we do give, uh, as I said, credit to the photographer, photographers for any of these images that are all uh, past city artists uh, awarded artists from, from this program. So um, let's go to the next one. I think the next slide has my contact information. Um, yeah. So um, again, I uh, this is the last, this is the second of two uh, workshops, the virtual workshops. Um, what comes up next are um, scheduled two draft reviews and draft reviews are really maybe 15, 20 minute phone appointments where I can answer you know, any kind of questions that you might have. If you have a draft of your narrative uh, uh i'm happy to review it uh but most mostly artists call make those appointments and it's really just answering generic questions about the application uh much like we are doing tonight and that's okay too um i do i was informed today that the draft reviews are all booked up so what you can do i would recommend is you can email me my emails on that uh, on the screen right now, and uh, and I can set up a 15-minute uh, phone appointment uh, with you. Um, I will be uh, out of the office in March, but there will be one of my colleagues who is actually going to be um, responding to some of these questions while I'm gone. And um, I think Marshawn, who is helping me on this uh, evening, uh with the powerpoint is also someone who is available to answer questions as well um so i think uh is the next slide i believe uh going into the next presentation in which case let's stop here and maybe um take five minute a five minute break and then we will come back uh, and start with uh, Tyler Sipes from uh, Seattle Channel, who will uh, give some uh, really great tips and uh, tools, resources on not just social media, but um, 
and we're pivoting over to a virtual platform. It's really great um, tips and tools. So let's um, take a break for just about five minutes and uh, and we'll see you back shortly. Hey, Irene. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, I'm just wondering, you know, it could be now or in five minutes before we switch to Tyler. Myself and Annette had questions in the chat, and I'm just wondering if you could um, take a look at those beforehand. I can, except I, I bet some people may have left their stations. Can Do you mind if I maybe have uh, five minutes just to give people five minutes and then I'll... Oh, of, of course, of course. A few questions, sure. And I don't know who that was. Who was that that asked that question? I'm just curious. Zoe. Yeah, it was Zoe. Thank you. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you. Yeah, I finished a little, a little later, I think, than the last one. I talked slower. That's why. <laughs> I didn't talk as fast as the first one. Um, Yeah, the simplified application um, really was uh, something that uh, came out of a uh, number of focus groups and um, that we had in 2013 through 2015, where artists basically shared with us that um, making the application more user friendly and less time consuming um, was really the, the major feedback that we got. And so we went back and uh, revamped the application so that it's less about, as I mentioned earlier, it's less about the project and the budget and the promotional plan and more about the artist uh, and the inspirations that the artists have um, in the arc, sort of the arc of the development of your practice over time and what what has sort of driven that, you know, that um, the development of that practice or um, whether it's the artistic end or the business end, either one, um, and how where and how that is looking in the future. How is that going to change in the future? Um, because artists, I know, um, maybe even uh, maybe five or six years ago, we had a cycle, and it was the literary cycle, uh, literary visual media, where we had, uh, I think it was maybe six to eight artists who submitted, um, uh, at that time it was a project-based application, so they submitted project ideas that had to do with um, with family issues and um, with a certain certain um, generation, maybe the uh, generation, the boomer generation, who were ha all have experiencing uh, aging issues with their parents, and so there were a lot of caregiving. So lots of stories, lots of films, uh, lots of um, photography of family photos, because so much of that was being experienced by by the artists but now of course there are all kinds of covid related uh agendas that might be out there but that doesn't mean that it has to be covid related it can be really anything that inspires you and that is what you want to talk about in the narrative um and i don't know if our five minutes are up Should we go into the questions? Sure. So is playwriting included in uh, the funding? Play, uh, playwriting is not included in this cycle. Uh, script or screenwriting film, film scripts are included, but not play scripts. That is in the following cycle for theater. Um, 
But if you have a question about that, I'm happy to, uh, if you want to send me an email, uh, I'd be happy to, to chat with you via email or phone. And the next question is architecture, art installation with architectural roots included in the visual arts. I would say that um, architecture, if, if that is a major focus of the work, um, I will tell you that architecture is not, um, someone with the architectural background will not be on the panel. Um, uh, however, design and visual art, be it um, painting or even graphics, um, photography, you know, all of the above, all the, the visual art genres, uh, but architecture design is, so it's possible, you know, uh, just, I think you want to consider how much of the work is focused on architecture. And again, I'm happy to talk with you uh, if you want to send me an email. And that's it for the questions so far. Okay. Okay, so um, I don't know if anyone has more questions for the chat uh, or if you, you know, want to ask them verbally. I think we have them on recording. Okay. Well, I think um, we have like six more minutes. Um, if there are no more questions, what I'd like to do is maybe invite uh, Tyler to go ahead and start. Sure, I can go. Uh, is Marshawn putting up the PowerPoint? Yeah, she's going to okay. put up the uh, PowerPoint. And again, just want to ask everybody to mute and uh, and submit your questions on the chat, and we'll go over them uh, at the end of uh, Tyler's presentation to include both questions for me and for him. Um, go one more slide forward. Okay. Um, I could start now. Is everyone ready? Yeah. Yes. So, uh, yeah, thank you for joining uh, my presentation. I'm going to be talking kind of broadly about social media strategy and video production that you guys consider um, with your guys' uh, creative um, products. Um, I'm here to impart some of my work experiences um, working at the Seattle channel that I've learned kind of through trial and error and um, in doing so I hope I can give you things to think about more broadly in the way that you use social media and maybe you haven't been thinking about strategy but now could be a time to do that as you're exploring applying to grants and using uh, social media audiences kind of like a test case. Um, again you may not be thinking of your creative work as a business but um, I think that these um, principles be helpful for you guys to experiment and uh, yeah, apply to your own social media profiles and platforms. Okay, Marshawn, you can next. Um, so again, my name's Tyler and my role at the Seattle channel is a multimedia producer. And if you guys haven't uh, tuned into the Seattle channel, we're the city's municipal TV station. 
we feature more than just uh, city council me meetings and mayor press conferences, but we also feature stories of the people of Seattle and the places that are important to the city, um, including artists, musicians, uh, creatives, nonprofits, and more. Um, and part of my job is to distribute our original content um, on the Seattle channel social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and um, we're moving into TikTok, which is an exploding social media product that's very popular, not only now with uh, young people, but um, it's getting popular with people of all ages. Um, since I've kind of come in at the Seattle channel, um, we've adapted and learned by using a lot of data analytics. And uh, we've kind of fine tuned our strategy on posting social media using that data. So again, for this presentation, I'll apply kind of what I've learned to go over some of the tips um, for social media strategy that could be helpful to you. Um, and also talk uh, briefly about uh, video production for social media. And then also uh, lastly, we'll kind of provide some local resources that might be of help to you all. Okay, next slide. Um, first, I kind of want to take a big picture look and strategy at social media. I think these principles kind of um, fit all the social media platforms. Um, but before I get into that, I want to kind of have you guys reflect on how you guys consume digital content. Um, these days, almost, I think more than 90% of your digital consumption is done on your mobile device, your smartphone, and it's less on your computer. And so knowing that you should be creating your social media posts for um, your smartphone and rather than thinking that it's gonna be on someone's computer or desktop. Um, it's also important to kind of keep in mind like what kind of posts you pause on and engage with. It, if there's something in particular that you find fascinating, kind of think of a trend that you often uh, click on something. At, at the Seattle channel, we've kind of learned that our keys to successful posts normally include a combination of these factors, like a, a very visually eye-catching um, image, um, engaging um, social media chatter um, that tends to be short in summary. And then social media that also um, kind of uh, caters to the lean in experience. And what I mean by the lean in, in experiences is, is like uh, videos that are exp experimental and unexpected, they often do very well. And using um, compelling and thought provoking imagery that spurs uh, discussion. And it's also really important to write social media text or summaries that is authentic and co conversational. So kind of um, use your voice to write your social media summaries. Um, I think that really resonates with um, audiences. You often, I think a lot of people uh, sometimes tend to sound like the voice of God or our parents or give the appearance of um, wagging your finger. So kind of steer away from uh, talking at people and talk to people. Um, yeah, uh, next slide. So now I'm kind of going to go over some granular things that are more spe specific to some of the specific social media platforms. Um, I also wanted to mention that I'll be, we'll be giving out a handout on video tips and then also for the resource guide at the end, um, if this kind of seems overwhelming. Um, uh, when you start working on your social media, it's important to think of your audience and writing and catering to that audience on that specific platform. Um, so for example, Instagram and TikTok have a much younger demographic than most of the other um, platforms. So make sure your um, social media writing is conversational and lighthearted in tone um, and actually use emojis. I know that sometimes seems funny or trivial, but I remember we had an intern several years ago and she basically said she doesn't look at Instagram text or captions unless it has an emoji. Um, so take that. Uh, and then uh, Facebook is kind of trending to be a, an older demographic. So it's important to still use an engaging voice, but uh, a to the point and prompt tone does best. Um, and the reason for this is because uh, your tone in your social media summary on Facebook can kind of dictate how the conversation can go in the comments section. I think like in government and businesses, we always get worried if um, 
for bad actors and comments. So again, just kind of being you ultimately set the tone of what the conversation will be like on your social media posts. Uh, if you're a you, user of Twitter or you, you're interested in using Twitter, it has a very diverse demographic set. And because Twitter is constrained by character set, it's a really good exercise in writing pithy, short um, social media posts. Um, trending hashtags do well on this platform, as do uh, time elements, uh, breaking news things. Um, and as I was doing research for this presentation, I was reading that writing shorter social media summaries are not just handy on Twitter, but statistically the um, posts that are below 250 characters can get you 60% uh, more engagement than you might have if you have like a, a post that's several paragraphs long. That's kind of um, discouraged. Um, it's always important whether you're a private person on your social media or um, a government agency or private company to always engage with your audience. Um, be sure to like and respond to comments. Uh, the more likes and comments your post gets, uh, there's an algori algorithm with most of the social media um, platforms that the more engagement you have on a post, the more likely your post is going to be seen um, by more eyeballs, more people. Uh, plus, um, engaging is kind of affirming for you and starts to extend a, a dialogue with your community and your audience and provides better awareness um, for the public as you as a creative, and it also improves um, authenticity for your um, work. Um, this next tip of variety and providing diverse content is kind of more geared for Facebook, but it's also kind of applies to all the social media platforms. Um, diversity in uh, content is kind of the spice of life in that you should be posting maybe a video, photo, photo gallery, link post, or a text card post. Um, and the reason that is, is because think about how you consume um, content on Facebook. For example, I read a lot of news stories, so Facebook sends me more link-oriented posts, more news-oriented posts, whereas my partner, he um, watches a lot of videos and he looks a lot of photos, so his Facebook looks a lot different than mine. Um, visuals and, and design aspect of uh, social media is very important. Um, it's what draws people in immediately. So if you decide on doing a link post, for example, like with a blog or an article, make sure you have a featured image. Um, there's a significant drop off if you do not have a featured image in a, a blog post, for example. And, and photo posts in general um, are often the best post to um, post because they get most engagement uh, more than links, more than videos, more than text-based updates. Um, they actually account for 93% of the most engaging posts on Facebook. Um, as you think of putting uh, different types of content on your social media, I really encourage you to uh, profile yourself or do vignettes of people that you work with. Um, featuring yourself or members of your time of your team from time to time, um, I think ultimately connects you to uh, a broader audience. People connect with other people. And uh, it's good to let people know who is behind the creativity. And uh, it also makes your work more accessible. Um, if you do have several social media accounts, it's always a good idea to maybe like uh, cross promote those. Instagram and Facebook um, obviously work together now these days. But if you're on Twitter, for example, or TikTok, you can um, post those uh, tweets and TikToks to Facebook. Uh, you can obviously post TikTok, well, maybe it's not obvious, uh, upload TikTok videos to Instagram, um, et cetera. Uh, next slide. Um, and so at the Seattle channel, a uh, video is kind of our bread and butter. Um, so hopefully you all can find some useful tips um, in creating video that's short, simple to the point, and you can kind of do on the fly. Um, in a perfect world, all the social media platforms would treat all video the same, but um, each platform has unique requirements that you might find frustrating, but if you are aware of them, you can save yourself a lot of time and work by um, making a video that will work for all of them. Uh, video length is uh, one example. Um, next slide. Oh, I think you need to go back one slide. 
Okay. Um, sorry. Yeah, you can go to next slide. Um, so making the first image counts in your video is really uh, important. Uh, videos have preview images when they're um, uploaded to social media. So um, the first three seconds of your video are kind of a make or break for your audiences. You always need to consider your most compelling visuals and you need to use a uh, really great ambient or really great sound bite out of the gate. If you think about how you scroll through social media, if you see a video that just even takes a couple seconds to get going, it's already lost your attention. Um, I think a lot of people that do video um, who are experienced and who are also new to the game have a tendency to want to use fade-ins or a black slate to start a social media, media video. And you can see in this example what this does. Um, that's what it previews on Instagram and what it previews on Twitter. And so visually, it's not, it doesn't make you curious. You won't want to click on it. So again, it's a good idea to uh, put a preview image or slate in the very beginning of your video. Things like Facebook and Instagram let you manually uh, do that, but um, Twitter does not. So again, I always recommend just putting a, a still image right before that's maybe the most visually appealing and that would really hook people into watching your video. Next slide. Uh, text on video or photos should be um, very deliberate. You don't want to distract from the vis visual message that you're trying to get across. Um, for example, use of text when it is meant to complement the visual information or the video or photo is always a good idea. Um, you can use text to make an announcement or if the text is more compelling than available uh, visuals or imagery, that's also a good time to use a text-based post. post. Um, uh, other examples are you could use a powerful quote or you can do a call to action as a text post. Um, whatever you do, try to avoid having the text um, on important visual information. So for example, in this example of the local Seattle band, the Black Tones, notice how the, the text is not over their face. You'll commonly see that, I think, personally, and I think objectively, you could say that would be a mistake. Um, next slide. Uh, so this uh, slide kind of gets to my earlier point on how all the social media platforms have different variables. The easiest thing you could do is make your video no more than a minute if you're going to be considering doing a video for social media because then it would fit all the social media platforms. But as you can see here, um, here's the maximum amount of length that your video can be. I'm going to put an asterisk for Instagram because they have many video components. Uh, a post is a minute, an Instagram story is 15 seconds, um, and IGTV is up to one hour, and an Instagram reel, something new that Instagram has rolled out that's similar to TikTok, is one minute. Uh, next post. Um, so Immediacy and impact kind of goes a long way when creating a short video. And you probably want to know how you can make an impact in what seems like such a short period of time, um, 60 seconds or less. But it it's pretty, you don't have to do much in the sense like if you have a, an emotional soundbite or a really compelling quote or a powerful visual video clip that makes the viewer linger and want more are always going to have a huge impact right out of the gate and um, uh, make people interested in continuing on your uh, post. Um, and if you can trigger any kind of emotional response, it has a better chance of not only being memorable for your audience, but it has more uh, likelihood of being shared, um, repeatedly watched over and over again, and engaged with. So again, that gives you like a it, it expands your audience because, again, that greater engagement means that uh, a platform like Facebook is more likely to share your content with strangers that are connected to your friend group. Um, it's always a good idea to also bring like a human element um, in your story, especially in the beginning. Um, people want to follow a character or person through a story, your story often, and see how it re relates to them. So next slide.
Um, I don't have a design background, so I found a lot of use of apps and online programs that have helped me and my colleagues at the Seattle Channel um, with our design deficits on creating text posts. Um, you can see here some examples that are very colorful. Um, they'll definitely catch your eye more than just a, kind of a static text post. Um, some apps and um, online programs are listed below. Um, uh, many of them are free, but also have a paid version. We at the Seattle channel, like Canva, has a number of well-designed templates that you can use for something like a, for traditional media, like um, business cards or posters, but it also allows you to do Instagram posts, Instagram stories, and TikTok stories. So it's uh, pretty dynamic. Um, and I think the annual uh, rate for that is like $60. So it's, it's not in, too expensive. Uh, next slide. Um, so video editing probably seems really intimidating if you um, haven't done it before, but video editing can be a pretty fun adventure um, when you should just think of it as kind of experimenting. Um, and one thing to consider as you plan on editing video is to maybe pick a product that you can edit on your computer and on your phone. So an example of that would be Adobe products. Adobe has Adobe Premiere, which is for computers and desktops, and has Adobe Rush, which um, you can edit video on your smartphone. And they have a lot of similar overlaps. So that way you're kind of um, exercising your brain using the same platform. If you have an Apple computer, uh, they have a program called iMovie. It's extremely intuitive. Um, and they also have a similar product for mobile device. Um, a lot of these uh, video editing apps are free, but then there comes a point where if you want to have more bells and whistles, you'll have to pay for them or pay for some of the features. Um, next slide. So with those uh, social media tips and vid video production tips in mind, you can consider using some of these posts uh, to link to your work when you're pitching. Um, at the Seattle channel, we often are, um, when someone's pitching to us, they'll link to their video that was posted on Facebook. And in a way that's really good because it shows us maybe how popular the video was within the Facebook ecosystem. Um, at the Seattle channel, we often get um, yeah, pitches from videographers and the common theme for a successful video pitch that I think can be applied more universally to any art medium really is um, keep the pitches short and keep them focused and keep them to the point. Um, you want to kind of think of your uh, pitch as uh, something that you could do and summarize in an elevator in about 30 seconds in an elevator ride. Um, it's always good to know your audience, do some sleuthing about the organization, who they are, and how does their how your work aligns with theirs. Um, and I think it's always important in your pitch to answer the question, why should you, why should anyone care? Why should uh, the people receiving your pitch care? Um, if you're pitching with a video um, linked to your pitch, I think it's a good good idea to make the first 20 seconds of the video really nail your opening. Um, again, you can open with a question, an interesting fact or statistic, a personal story, a compelling quote, a captiv captivating scene setter, anything that draws your audience in, and that includes people you're pitching to. Um, video should be no longer than five minutes, and I think even for uh, this workshop, um, video submissions have to be less than five minutes. Um, you could also consider uh, making uh, social media shorts or trailers for longer videos, um, posting them on Instagram to kind of um, see how they might resonate with your audience. Um, and when you are submitting pitches, um, the best, my best advice is to use uh, YouTube or Vimeo. Um, they're easy to access, they're easy to embed and uh, they don't cause any hiccups in places like um, the city of Seattle, for example. We have a strict security filter, so we can't use uh, things like Dropbox. Uh, next. next slide. 
um, in addition to pitching uh, the Seattle channel, you could think of reaching out to these organizations to help amplify your work. Uh, most of these organizations uh, listed here are minority and community led and provide resources to artists and can help uh, promote and amplify your work, um, not in just the traditional gallery sense, but also in their social media or e newsletters. Um, they also, a lot of these organizations provide great uh, networking opportunities, and a lot of them uh, provide free to affordable educational programs and workshops. Um, and again, I have these listed out in a handout summarizing uh, what they specialize uh, in their medium um, and links to their websites. And next slide. Yeah, that's all for me. If you guys have any questions, do let me know. Um, that's uh, you can reach me at email and that at Seattle channel that's for all of our platforms from Instagram, YouTube, um, Facebook, TikTok, etc. So I'm going to start with the very first question, which goes back to the first hour and then there'll be some questions about social media. So, Irene, uh, could this grant fund a class or workshop that the artist teaches? That could certainly be part of what you do. Um, a lot of why I'm hesitating is uh, where, because we don't know about uh, closures or when venues will be open. And in, we hope that by 2022, 2023, uh, that will be different than it is now, in which case the idea is that you have some kind of public uh, event that you can invite the general public to. When you only have a workshop and it's uh, a limited uh, invitation, then it, it's less of a public event. But could it be an online event? Yes, it can be an online event. And that may be something that our office maybe um, will be more open to, mostly because it's what most artists are doing now. And we think that that's probably going to be something that. Uh, continues whether uh, venues open or not. So I would say the workshop is would be a good kind of a good outreach to a particular population, but it would probably not be your public general public event. And I'm again, I'm happy to talk with you about that uh, via email or phone. The next question is, what is the role of social media and artist visibility within the application? What weight does it have in choosing who gets funding? Um, are you, uh, is that a question about how you're going to use social media? And that's what you would talk about in the application. Um, you know, if, if Aurora, do you want to ask? Uh, yeah, um, thank you for uh, putting this all together. Uh, my question was mostly, I guess, uh, considering how or if like an artist's current online presence has any weight within the application, as in like their ability to either like self-promote or outsource that labor to someone else. Uh -huh. I my question is kind of is related. Like I wanted to know if employing social media is um, critical to getting funded or will have an impact on getting funded. And that's in the chat too. But yeah. okay, but, no, it is not. Um, for the purposes of the application, again, you want to focus the application on the history, the history and the development of you, of you as an artist and your work. Uh, the work sample is uh, really you want to select whether you're a writer or a media artist or a visual artist images of work that you feel very strongly about that you feel is some of your best work and uh, maybe 50% of the work sample is that, and the other 50% might be uh, a sketch or uh, an early little clip of something that is in progress so that the reviewer can see something that is finished, polished, and you feel very strongly about versus 
a piece that is still in progress, but the reviewer can get a sense of what it is, can visualize what it is that your idea is. Okay. Um, I'm not sure that I answered the question for Aurora. Um, Aurora, do you want to share some more about um, your longer post too? I can kind of, I, I can answer Aurora's second question. And it is a great question. Um, because I work in government, I'm very data obsessed. Um, but I think for artists, getting your social media the most um, likes is not a priority, but engagement definitely is. And um, platforms like Instagram are really great in creating engagement with your audience in a more organic way. Um, if you are using Instagram and creating Instagram stories, I'm sure you are familiar with maybe the lean in experience of um, having questions asked of your audience. Um, I used to work as a photojournalist, so a lot of uh, photojournalists I follow, I have seen them solicit um, advice on which photo people think they should be putting in competitions or portfolios. Um, so there's polls and uh, TikTok is also a great engagement thing where you can, um, a lot of followers uh, do at things at the person that posted a video, for example, and there can be just a two way conversation because a lot of times in social media, the conversation just flows one way, but TikTok, Instagram, and to agree, uh, Facebook and um, Twitter, uh, you can have that two way organic conversation that is much more valuable. So. Yeah, and I can just add for the purposes of the application, um, the reviewers are asked to assess only the, the information, the materials that you submit on your application. Um, the application itself asks for a website uh, if you're, so that will be in the application. However, that will not be um, a, a piece of information that the reviewers are asked to assess uh, only because there are artists who do not have websites. So that's an uneven playing field. Uh, so what will be assessed is the narrative questions, the resume and the work sample, and that's it. And the work sample should reflect whatever the art form is that you're applying in. And this is a question for Tyler. What is the best way to repost on Instagram? Um, I'm assuming maybe like reposting uh, someone. But we see that quite frequently when someone's reposting um, a video of ours and there's no native way of doing that within Instagram. So you would require downloading a secondary party app. And there is one simply called repost that I think is most popular and it's free and pretty easy to use. There's a, not another app that helps with reposting on Instagram called regram. Those are options, but there's probably many, many more. That's where we're at with questions. So if anybody else has any, you can just pipe up. Yeah, I also wanted to just talk a little bit about the work sample because it does vary for each art form. Um, and you want, you want to adhere to the guidelines of the work sample. It is what is equivalent to five minutes for literary and visual arts. So five minutes for a video clip is pretty straightforward. It's five minutes, or if you have two video clips, it's two and a half minutes and two and a half minutes or two and three minutes so that it totals five minutes. Um, the equivalent for images is eight images. So again, you want to select images that you feel are your best work, uh, finished polished pieces, and maybe some that are representative of work in progress, perhaps. Um, and then with literary, uh, it's it's the same. You want to, it's um, 10 pages is the maximum. So if you have one piece that you want to submit and you want to select the pieces, perhaps the pages that you feel 
the strongest about, whether it's poetry or a novel, whatever, you know, you want to identify those 10 pages that you feel very strongly about. Uh, or you can submit five pages of a finished polished piece and five pages of a work in progress. But again, you want to be you want to make sure that you also describe these work samples in the application. So not just submitting them, but saying this is the first, these are the first five pages of a short story. And you know, the what I what the strength of this these first five pages is is a you know, then that's what you're gonna describe. You know, that is what you're you're wanting the reviewer to see. And the same goes for uh, visual arts or uh, or media. You're selecting that clip for a very specific reason, but you also want to tell the reviewer why you picked those particular minutes. Okay. Yeah, Adrian had added in as a filmmaker, should my work sample be a portion of the film I've made or a complete short film? So it probably goes within that time frame. Yeah. So again, you can you can choose, you know, two minutes and three minutes of either of either one so that you get you show the best of both, right? You show some clip of the, the work in progress that you want to convey something, whether it's a particular technique or you want to emphasize this is the storyline uh, or this is the main character uh, or this was a pivotal scene. Um, uh, so, so when you select that work sample, it is, it is pretty important. So, um, I think even if you ran it by someone who, you know, someone whose work you, you really admire or you trust their, um, you know, their assessment of your work, you might just run it by someone also, just, um, if, if you're not sure. Um, and I'll just add uh, some comments from the last uh, cycle for literary media and visual arts. We received a very high number of work samples, and these were media work samples that were really kind of collages or montages of soundbite, 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 and no real development. So that even in two and a half minutes, the reviewers want to see a development of something within those two minutes. Uh, and what happens when artists submit uh, sound bites, too many sound bites, the reviewer really doesn't get a sense of what, what your work is about. So you want to really stay away from short clips. Uh, I think sometimes artists think that they want to show the breadth of what they've done. And in the process, uh, it doesn't really allow the reviewer to really sink their teeth into a sample. So, so Irene, there's a follow up of um, do you have to show a portion of a project that you're hoping to fund, such as a film? Like, if you haven't done it yet, is that a requirement to have a, a chunk? Mm -hmm. It is not a requirement. So. Obviously, for for let's say uh, an applicant who who is really requesting funds for research, so the idea is really maybe even in their head. It's not even on paper yet. Uh, so the best thing there would be to submit a finished polished piece that you feel really strongly about, that you feel is some of your best work, and then you want to articulate because this application is not about the work; it is about you as an artist and your, uh, you know, and your trajectory, you want to convey how that has evolved over time. And this is, you know, and, and you kind of have an idea of what, where you're headed, whatever that foggy, maybe, uh, inspiration might be. I also mentioned earlier with resumes, um, you want to include 
make sure to include anything and everything that focuses on your work as an artist, be it if you uh, participated in a panel presentation, if you edited um, some article, um, if you taught a class or gave a workshop, um, any, any of that, or even if you mentored or coached, you know, an emerging artist, uh, you want to include all of that in your resume because it really does inform um, the reviewers, especially if they don't know you and they don't know your work, it really gives them uh, a, a good um, picture, you know, encapsulation of what you have done and, and everything that you have done related to your uh, to your artistic practice. Um, how, how lo um, long of a, well, what's the maximum length of a resume that you should submit? Probably two to three pages um, okay. should be it. Uh, you don't want to go too far back. You also want to consider that in terms of your work sample. You don't want to go too far back. Uh, you want to make it more recent and, um, uh, and, I, and I say that because you also want to be uh, kind to the reviewers. They're, they're going to have lots of applications to read. And so um, the size font, uh, the format of the resume, the format of your literary sample, all of that, uh, just, just remember that these reviewers have uh, 200 applications. And um, so you want to you know, be kind. <laughs> I think it's getting close to dinner time for some folks. <laughs> We're all getting quiet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, here comes one. Does it make sense to include my job as a community college filmmaking instructor on the resume? Well, that if you're submitting an application uh, for media film, I would say that's pretty significant. Um, usually, if uh, there are educators. But they're they're edu like K through five educators, and they're submitting an application as a theater artist. That might, unless they're teaching theater, like at a high school, you know, where it's a little more related. But in your case, um, I would I would say yes, include it. And also, I just wanted to say that during the the contracting. So if you're selected for funding, uh, if there are uh, details of your either your event, the venue, uh, the audience, all of those are not rock solid. Uh, I think we that's part of my job is I try to work with you to try to develop that. Um, I think where it gets uh, a, there's a sense of urgency is if you if you are. Uh, planning on presenting your work in the early part of the following year. So in early part of uh, 2022, in January, February, you'll want to have, um, you'll want to have a lot of the details solid because that contract, you'll want to get that contract signed, sealed, and delivered so we can pay you um, if you're presenting in January. But otherwise, if you're, if you're forecasting, you know, end of the year 2022, um, then you have some time to to work on those details, and then uh, and then you can uh, work that out over time. So you don't have to have the contract immediately. But I do go by uh, date of event or forecasted event. That's that's how I try to uh, work out the the contract. But there are some people who who have their project in mind, like they know when, they know where, they know with whom. Uh, and so for those individuals, um, getting the contract out, even if they're presenting in October, is totally okay, because the, the sooner I can get the contract out, the better. 
and the sooner you can get paid at least partial payments. So that's that's the incentive <laughs> is you can get uh, you can get at least an early paycheck up in the front, but you have to you have to um, you have to uh, substantiate work that you have done. So if you submit an invoice January third, and then you tell me you've edited your whole film, you're telling me that you edited the whole film between January one and January second, and that that may not be <laughs> realistic. So uh, so you want to be you, you want to have a chunk of work completed, and we cannot pay you for anything that's happened this year. It's got to be next work that you've done next in the following year. Okay. Okay, and I just want to uh, remind you that I um, uh, can give you more feedback or answer more questions. I know there were a couple of questions that were asked that I felt maybe needed a little more conversation. So I'm happy to to talk with you either via email or phone. Um, and uh, and the, like I said, the draft reviews are I think already full. A couple of them are taking waiting lists, but I actually haven't looked at the waiting list, so I don't know how long it is. There are cancellations, uh, but um, again, take you know, take advantage of emailing me or uh, making a, a phone appointment. I'm happy to talk with you and um, willing to to answer all of your questions as much as I can to help you prepare for the for the application. Okay, if there are no more questions, we're um, six, what, 640, so we're a little early, but if uh, you have no more questions, uh, I'm happy to give it five more minutes. Yes, hello. This is Erin. I had a question. I'm not sure if you can hear me, though. I can. I was just wondering. I was late joining, so you might have said this, and I apologize. But um, I was just wondering if there's going to be, if this is, uh, the session has been recorded and we can listen to it online. Yeah, uh, you know, I actually forgot to push the recording button uh, until, what, like 15 minutes into or more than 15 minutes. I don't. Anyway, uh, but I, the content of my presentation is actually completely repetitive from the first one. So, um, so I, then the first one was completely recorded. So, um, so when it's ready to be posted, the, the link to the uh, video, it, it'll be the same exact information. Only I actually talked a little bit faster on the first one. That's the only difference. Um, and then all the questions on the chat and the responses are also recorded. And then where would we find that link? Uh, you know, that is a good question. I need to find that out myself since this is the first time I've done a video workshop. <laughs> and I, I think that this is posted on the website, but um, I'm not sure if that's the case or if I just send it to everybody that uh, registered for the workshop. And it might just be both, just to be on the safe side. Okay, so you'd send it out via email to everybody that um, that uh, registered for the workshop. That registered, yeah. Or or I'll send an email and say it's now posted on the website. Go to that email. Then I'll the I just went to look, and it's not up there quite yet, but I think it should yeah. be soon. I think uh, the comms team was working on it. Yeah, it's in development and I think they wait for the second workshop. So if there are the, the mostly it's the Q and a, cause they figured there might be some different questions. Uh, that are asked between the 2 workshops. So I think it, it should be posted pretty soon, but either I will send it to you. Uh, people who registered or, um, uh, or send you a message that it's posted on the website. For both. Great. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for uh, for coming, and um, 
and good luck on your application. And again, just call or email me. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Bye, Esther. <laughs> Bye or bye. <laughs> no. Okay. Well, thanks, Irene, for having me join. Oh, hey, Tyler, hopefully. thank you so much. What a wealth of information you were. My God. I know that's kind of a lot. No, it was great. I mean, I think people really appreciate, you know, who don't. You know, you're more immersed in that world. So it's really great for people to hear all these new apps and so forth. I thought it was great. You all need to be your own biggest cheerleaders. And I think people maybe <laughs> don't think necessarily about strategy when they're trying to show their showcase their work and talent. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, it's it's true. Um, like I said, I mean, we got lots of um, Lots of work samples that were just quick sound bites, and it was really, it was really tough, you know, because the the reviewers may not have known that artist, but they they knew even less from the, <laughs> from the sound bites because they couldn't see anything develop yeah. over a two minute, you know, period of time. Well, I'm gonna log off, but uh, do get a hold of me if you have any questions or you need any revisions of material that you're going to be giving okay. as handouts. Sounds great. Sounds okay. great. And if you want to hit st stop recording. <laughs> yeah. Thanks everyone. And thanks Marshawn for being an expert <laughs> slide.